Greetings. Welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, and all the wonderful things that go with it. Um, coming to you on Saturday night, January 12th, 2019. It's going to get into a couple articles tonight. And real quick, I think I'm going to do, pretty sure I'm going to do a live stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific. So 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, if you all can tune in, I should be here at my station uh, with my microphone on and the live stream going. So if you all can join in, that would be great. Uh, so heard a couple people talking about this. Um, I see a lot of things that are just kind of in my periphery and then you know I don't have time to really focus on it and then somebody asks a specific question like hey did you see this and then uh, lickety split wham bam Osama had a link and here it is from popular science the polar vortex the polar vortex split apart here's what to expect you'll want a winter coat and this is from yesterday The polar vortex is making big changes for the new year around January 1. This whirling blob of cold air, which sits 10 to 30 miles above the surface of the North Pole, broke apart into at least two sister vortices. Disruptions like this can cause a ripple effect leading to chilly weather further south, and meteorologists say there's potential for a spell of wintry weather to hit the northeastern U.S. and western Europe toward the end of the month. But we don't know that for certain just yet. Here's why. What the polar vortex is and isn't. Though we might associate the polar vortex with anomalous cold weather and nor'easters, it's not unusual at all. Sometimes you see headlines like the polar vortex is coming, says William Sevior, uh, an atmospheric scientist at the University of Bristol. In fact, the polar vortex is always there. A Every fall, as the Arctic loses light and becomes especially cold, the greater disparity in temperature between the North Pole and Equator leads to the formation of the polar vortex. These cold westerly winds make their home in the stratosphere, the second atmospheric layer up in the, from the ground level troposphere. It looks like a very large tornado, says Michael Ventrice, meteorolog a meteorologist with the weather company, but much more macro scale. If left alone, the, por uh, the vortex hangs out through winter and dissipates in late spring. But roughly every other year on average, waves of warm air intrude on the vortex in what's called sudden stratospheric warming. Is it really every other year? Um, I heard that this was something that occurred uh, much more infrequently until recently. <clears throat> but maybe it's every other year now. Because it seems like it's basically almost every year now. Uh, it really is sudden temperatures, uh, sudden stratospheric warming. Temperatures in this part of the atmosphere warm by as much as 50 C or 90 Fahrenheit in just a few days. When this happens, the vortex either moves south or is split apart. And then sometimes, but not always, this disruption of the vortex leads to cold weather in the mid-latitudes, including the northeastern U.S., Western Europe, and Northern Asia. These are quite dramatic events, says Sevior. Even though they happen in the stratosphere, we see an impact that propagates down to the surface. Sevior adds that it's incorrect to say the polar vortex is moving to those affected areas. While it can move a little south in a disruption, the polar vortex, as scientists define it, is mainly confined to the stratosphere above the Arctic. Instead, the jet stream located in the troposphere moves south after a polar vortex disruption and brings the Arctic cold air with it. Uh, I was led to believe, or um, I was led to believe that this happened um, because of the intrusion of warm air, um, uh, because of climate change. Uh, this is happening more frequently now. Um, this year, the sudden stratospheric warming happened over Siberia in early December, pushed the polar vortex apart into two pieces, or maybe three, depending on who you ask. 
It's hard to clearly define since the boundaries are fuzzy. This created an area of high pressure in the Arctic, a phenomenon called high latitude blocking. These are the events that disrupt the Arctic Circle, pushing all the cold air out of the Arctic Circle into the mad mid the mad latitudes. The mid latitudes where we live, said Ventrice. Uh, yes, but what's scary is that you have warm air incursions into the Arctic, which um, make the Arctic warm, and the more northern latitudes warm. In this research, Sebior found that the splits of the vortex as opposed to the southward shifts tend to have a greater effect on weather. Ventris explains that because the warming started over Siberia, there will be a lag of 20 to 40 days before any weather effects are felt. The reason why this lag happens is unclear, but it may have to do with the distance and sea surface water temperatures. In contrast, last year, which also saw a split polar vortex, this has actually happened every single year for at least the last four years that I can remember. So it's happening all the time, which is abnormal. The warming started over the North Atlantic Ocean in early February, and the effects were felt much sooner. Recall the stories of the beast from the east that hit Europe last year in which 95 people died of weather-related causes. By the end of January, we might actually start to see weather effects, says Amy Butler, an atmospheric scientist at the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences in Boulder, Colorado. This potential shift to chillier weather could last as long as six weeks. Okay. Yeah, it, you know, this is all fine and well, but I think this is leaving out a lot of information. Uh, because what has been happening every single year is that we have extremely warm weather in the Arctic, extremely warm temperatures, um, which are abnormal, which push out the cold air into uh, more southerly latitudes than our, uh, our is usual, right? You know, it gets pushed further south, very, very cold weather, um, colder than usual. Um, this is definitely an abnormal pattern. Um, they're making it seem like, oh, it's just, you know, it's normal. It happens all the time. It happens all the time now because um, our weather is screwed up because climate change. Uh, moving on to an article from Nick Humphrey uh, from yesterday. You can find this article on his Patreon page and you can um, support his work there. Global oceans rapidly warming, accelerating marine extinction, superstorms, and sea level rise. A paper just published in the journal Science by Chang et al. 2019 indicates that global oceans are warming much faster. Uh, I guess this is what I was reading about yesterday than previously modeled and will continue to warm given the current and past emissions of greenhouse, ga greenhouse gases by human activities over 93% of the heat accumulating by the increasing greenhouse gas concentration is retained in the oceans. While the oceans warm far more slowly than the atmosphere because of a very high heat capacity, uh, 4.186 joules of heat per gram of water to heat it by one degree Celsius, uh, the effect of abrupt heat buildup in the Earth's oceans include the collapse of marine populations along with acidification, the intensification of ocean storms and sea level rise. We land animals concern ourselves with land warming, but our world is an ocean planet and ocean warming is global warming. And because of the slower temperature responses, the response of the oceans relative to the intense heat being forced applied to the oceans, their presence as the dominant mass on the planet's surface means that catastrophic to existential global warming has been baked into the climate system for decades to millennia into the future. Brief overview of Chang et al. Uh, previous studies using the AR5 climate model indicated a recent early 21st century rate of an of uh, increase in oceanic heat content in zero to 200 meter layer of uh, 4.2 zettajoules per year. Uh, recent research now suggests a warming rate of 6.2 zettajoules per year more than 45% higher than previously modeled. While the global land, air, sea surface temperature rec record is noisy because of year-to-year -year variability, oceanic heat content has been largely rising unabated, especially in the past decade. I will note five of the highest ocean heat content years in addition to five of the warmest 
global land air sea surface temperatures have been in the last five years. 2018 was the warmest year on record for Earth's oceans, exceeding 2017. The future of oceanic heat content and sea surface temperature anomalies were modeled using representative concentration pathway 8.5 business as usual and RCP 2.6, extremely rapid end of fossil fuel emissions and carbon dioxide gas removal, RCP 2.6, which I contend is simply not possible given the very short lead time and current technology scaling problems, which are significant, is ugly showing a mean warming of the global oceans of over 0.4 C by 2100 relative uh, to 1991 to 2005 baseline with a plus 1000 zettajoule ocean heat content anomaly in the first 2000 meter layer relative to the same baseline. RCP 8.5, meanwhile, shows ocean warming of near uh, 0.9 C uh, relative to 1991-2005, which is a plus 2,250 zettajoule of ocean heat content with around 0.3 C warming, uh, plus 800 zettajoules by 2050, 30 years from now. <clears throat> uh, there's some charts here. I will link this below so y'all can see all this. Um, Uh, upshot, not so good. Important caveats, the business as usual scenario only accounts for human emissions growth, does not account for increasing emissions of carbon dioxide and methane from melting land and subsea permafrost, rapidly increasing emissions from once carbon sinks or stores, namely tropical and boreal forests, and increasingly acidifying oceans, nor are climate models accurate in the effect of abruptly collapsing global sea ice with impacts, which impacts albedo. All reasons why the business as usual scenario should be considered a conservative scientific outlook. Ocean warming is global warming. With all that stated, the, this points toward catastrophic to existential impacts on global climate because the ex existing greenhouse gas concentration is permanent on long time scales, it will continue to warm the oceans and therefore the atmosphere for decades, even if emissions were stopped today, which they will not given the continued growth of the human population currently growing at 80 million people per year, uh, people in need of food, water, and shelter infrastructure production, which generates greenhouse gases because of energy requirements. Greenhouse gas gases would need to be released to build any sort of global renewable or carbon capture and storage infrastructure as well at the massive scales needed. So this is a really good point right here. Um, not to be a downer, a Debbie Downer on those who really get behind um, converting everything to renewable or, you know, electric cars and renewable uh, energy sources. <clears throat> those are all great, but you have to remember that uh, energy is used to build those um, technologies. Resources are also used to build those technologies. Um, a lot of those resources are highly toxic and also um, not very abundant. So we're going to run, you know, even if we ran full steam into um, replacing our current energy needs with renewables, uh, we wouldn't have enough resources um, and we would still, it would still require um, the, the actual production of these energy alternatives um, requires releasing carbon in the atmosphere. So um, it is a very um, harsh thing to, to acknowledge. Uh, not to mention the destruction, you know, just the habitat destruction that would be involved in making all these things. Um, production is destruction, period. You know, you can't have um, m massive construction infrastructure and production of materials without destroying the environment. You just cannot. Um, unless you have clean energy powering all those things, and those things don't um, somehow, you know, uh, just lead to environment destruction of their own right. And they, they always do. They always do. Especially at the scale that we're talking about. <clears throat> um, 
Anyways, to get back to the article, we are stuck on business as usual for the long haul without a global economic collapse. Greenhouse gas emissions are tied to economic growth and agricultural activities. A rapidly warming ocean will mean increasingly powerful ocean storms, tropical cyclones capable of more explosive intensification, and higher peak wind intensities, both tropical and frontal cyclones with higher precipitation rates, as well as both producing far more catastrophic storm surges a sea level rise exhibits exponential increase because of thermal expansion and heating of water at the foot of glaciers, speeding melting from Greenland and Antarctica. Ice sheet melt from Greenland would also lead to the collapse of the Atlantic uh, meridional overturning circulation uh, with its weakening causing increasingly chaotic weather patterns over North Atlantic regions. Eastern North America and Europe, and accelerating the collapse of the ice sheets further in a feedback loop. Continued ocean warming also means the collapse of marine populations leading to extinctions. Coral reefs are expected to suffer 70 to 90% mortality at 1.5 Celsius global surface warming. Warming likely in multiple years as early as 2030, just based on the worst case emission scenario and trends with their extinction likely on a plus two C earth. This alone is a catastrophe for marine food chains and humanity's use of the oceans for food. Warming seas as well as increasing acidification are also leading to marine life suffering problems with forming calcium carbonate shells as well as fish and other marine populations retreating poleward or to greater depths to escape the heat. Intense marine heat waves also impact atmospheric circulations, altering rainfall patterns and aiding in the production of heat domes. Intense blocking high pressure systems which can enhance drought and extreme heat conditions near land areas. Rapid sea level rise also destroys coastal ecosystems such as wetlands and estuaries. So given the existing greenhouse gas concentration near 500 parts per million of carbon dioxide equivalent, in 2018, based on paleoclimate records, this level would put us solidly on a path toward a mid-Pleocene Earth of 3 million years ago, where the long-term global climate was up to 3 to 4 C warmer than pre-industrial times and sea levels were 25 meters higher than today. However, because of the massive forcing humans have applied to the system via greenhouse gases, the planet is accelerating on this path on the order of decades as opposed to the progressive tens to, hundred, ten to, uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of years. Even the great typically slow inertia of the oceans and ice sheets cannot slow this violent pace of change dramatically enough to avert catastrophic to existential threats to humans and the biosphere of the planet, which needs extremely slow climate change to adapt. The, the fact that we've already, as a civilization, ris uh, have risen the greenhouse gas equivalent concentration from 280 to 500 parts per million and up to 1,500 gigatons of frozen carbon locked away within Arctic permafrost is currently melting means continued extreme climate change extraordinarily fast compared to natural climate change is certain. One study, Schaefer et al., 2014, indicates 120 gigatons of carbon emissions may come out of the land permafrost top three meter layer by 2100 using RCP 8.5 scenario, adding around 0.3 C to the total projected global surface temperature currently projected to be four to five C above pre-industrial. It may be higher if much of it comes out as the more short-lived but intense greenhouse gas of methane. In addition, it is the opinion of Dr. Peter Wadhams that there is a one in five chance, 20% of a significant multi-gigaton methane release from the subsea permafrost of the Siberian Arctic within the next five years. Given increasing emissions rates and ocean warming in the region, which could raise global temperatures rapidly on orders of years to decades, <clears throat> um, where was I? Sorry, I, I lost myself there. <clears throat> Given increasing emission rates and ocean warming in the region, which could raise global temperatures rapidly on orders of years to decades by 0.6 C or 0.6 to 1.3 C for every 50 gigatons released. This is based on varying estimates and methane emission rate scenarios by Dr. Wadhams and also Dr. Natalia Shakova of the University of Alaska Fairbanks. 
The, this risk will increase in the coming years as the sea ice continues to thin and retreat from the coastal seas of the Arctic Ocean. Obviously, any further rise in emissions from both humanity and natural stores will bake in further extreme climate change and extinctions of species over the course of the coming decades. The warming of the oceans and their ability to retain heat is and will continue to be a major player in this global process well into the future. Uh, good stuff from Nick Humphrey um, summing up um, what all that ocean heating means. Um, yeah, and to go back to what I was saying about, um, you know, energy and the energy involved in, in uh, replacing our energy sort, you know, <clears throat> our energy infrastructure with renewable energies. I mean, that in itself will be disruptive enough to our environment. Um, it's just going to cause further damage. Uh, probably more damage than the renewables will, will help. Uh, and that's why <clears throat> I talk about um, degrowth and other people talk about degrowth as well. If we're to have a chance, you know, we can't keep cycling the, the industrial civilization forward. We can't keep going forward. We need to bring everything way down, way down. Um, energy consumption overall, uh, um, industrial, you know, agricultural production, uh, everything, consumption, everything needs to come way, way down. <clears throat> we need to bring all of us um, unilaterally, globally, um, co need, to, need to have a coordinated drawdown of our consumption, our production, our population, everything needs to come way down. Uh, that needs to be built into whatever answers people are going to try, uh, <clears throat> whatever paths people are going to try and take to mitigate this problem. Um, anyways, that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, uh, peace. And I will see you tomorrow, live stream at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you.